Hello, my name is Calvin. This is Defund the BBC. Today, I have the privilege and the pleasure of being joined by my good friend, William Clouston. William, how are you doing? I'm very well, thanks, Calvin. Good to be here. Good, good. William is leader of the SDP. So you've been a member of the Social Democratic Party since the 1980s, and you were elected leader in 2018, and again in March this year. Am I right? That's right. Yeah, that's correct. Yeah. Brilliant. So tell me, the SDP's policy to uh, hold a review of the best way of safeguarding BBC editorial independence while ensuring full impartiality. Tell me, what does that mean? What is your basic policy around the BBC? Well, the basic policy around the, the first line of it is um, to get rid of the licence fee, which I think is a complete anachronism. So there's no need to charge uh, people a, basically a, a sort of poll tax, a flat tax for this service. Um, and so we need to get rid of that. The BBC can and will be and should be funded by uh, government directly, I think, and also by making more of its own subscription, and its, its own, um, <clears throat> you know, past programmes, and they can, they can monetize those. I mean, but, you know, broadly, the, the BBC, as we all know, is vastly bloated and it needs slimming down. So the first thing on, on, the, on the license fee is, as I say, to, to abolish that. Um, the issue over impartiality is the key problem. Uh, I think, I mean, we, we looked into this, Manik Govinda, who largely drafted our, our policy on culture, media and sport, we, we looked into this in great detail. Uh, we think that we should have a Royal Commission to examine, properly examine its bias. And we included Channel 4 in that, which is also a publicly funded broadcaster, because both organizations are failing to, be, to offer um, what their charters say they should offer. Um, which is which is to be uh, politically unbiased, um, and they're obviously failing in that. I mean, the, the recent look at look at uh, look at the examples uh, after 2016. Uh, the I mean, the, the BBC's attitude towards Brexit and its interviewing of panelists, its inclusion of panelists that were pro Brexit, showed that it was very very much out of tune with the mainstream opinion. Um, what was demonstrated as the mainstream opinion. Uh, through the vote. So, and it wasn't after, happy after the vote. Many of the um, uh, journalists showed bias there, but it's literally all over the place. I mean, I think they, they're not, Calvin, they're not, um, they're not dissimilar to many other institutions, are they, in this respect? I mean, they, they're showing a very similar level of bias that you find in other public institutions and universities and, and all over the place. But the BBC is chartered not to, uh, to be like that. And I think the reason, I mean, on the positive side, to be positive about it, uh, we've discussed privately, haven't we, about this. The, I mean, the BBC, the, the SDP is in favour of trying to save the BBC. Um, we think it's part of the, the national architecture and uh, a public broadcaster, I think, is necessary because it's unbiased. So I think unless you want to be uh, adopt the, uh, an American model where literally, you, you look at the news you want to get. Um, I, I think the BBC is in a unique position, should be in a unique position to be, to provide un, critically unbiased um, news reporting, but it doesn't do so. And that's, that's the problem. That is the problem. So you've, you've identified there that the BBC falls short on impartiality, uh, which is what gave it its strength in the first place. Mm. You know, we've seen with the general election, we've seen with Brexit, as you mentioned, with this pandemic. Um, mm. They do now have a new director general. So do you think Tim Davey can make your change? Uh, I, I have to say, I, I really hope so. But, you know, I, 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 I doubt it. I think he can probably make a little bit of change. But I think you've got to, what he's got to do is actually appoint people into positions of power throughout, not just the, the higher, the upper, limp, the upper management, but throughout the whole thing. And the problem there that we have, and we've got to be honest about this, all of us have got to be honest about it, is that, the, the cultural problems in these institutions are downstream uh, of very, very long-term trends in education and political thinking. And if they're downstream, it's very, very difficult to deal with. If, for instance, if, if the whole of your graduate intake, pretty much, is from Russell Group Universities or Oxbridge, and you're churning out <clears throat> basically the criteria for getting those jobs is, is very limited, which is, which is passing the particular type of exams in a particular way, uh, once they've gone through those universities, they largely uh, imbibe the, the progressive work ideology and they will come out thinking the same thing. So if your 
your recruitment base is that narrow, it's actually very difficult for a DG or anyone else to actually affect uh, serious change. I mean, look at the look at the problems that that corporations have now, uh, and look at you know, for instance, in social media channels. This is hilarious, but it's also very sad and serious. So you, you'll have a large multinational, you know, a huge corporation, and they'll have a uh, social media channels, and the and the people literally typing and punching in uh, uh, messaging into those social media channels will be people in their mid twenties, not really authorized by the board to say half the things they're saying, regurgitating the same sort of woke stuff that all of their contemporaries think and regurgitate. And there's your problem. You know, yes, you could change the DG, but really, um, unless you could put someone in charge uh, to take care of the messaging that reflects even to a little extent, a limited extent, the sort of mainstream hinterland view in this country, you, you, you've got major problems. So I think, unfortunately, it's going to take a little bit more than just the DG. I agree. I saw a really good article from you in Spiked uh, previously. I'm going to quote you here. Um, our state broadcaster is a purveyor of its own type of Pravda truth. Uh, far from being impartial, the BBC is staffed overwhelmingly by people holding liberal outlooks, and its yeah. coverage of the recent Black Lives Matter moral panic has been woeful. Uh, this is obviously linking to, uh, you know, your experience in Poland under communism. Um, we we kind of see this from our supporters as well, and people that we've polled uh, who say, you know, the BBC have this groupthink, and it's a very much a woke groupthink, or as you call it, a liberal outlook. Uh, and people are thinking that people are feeling that their views aren't being portrayed by the BBC. It has its own political agenda at this point. Um, you've kind of touched on it there, but I just wondered how you think the BBC might improve on that, or is it even possible at this point for them to come back from that? Well, because I, as I said, because it's downstream of the entire education system, it's very difficult to um, to sort of click your fingers and, and make a change. What we're hoping for is that um, is that, and there there are some little sort of glints of, of light here, uh, is that the um, Generation Z, the young, younger generation coming up, will, will actually be, start to be genuinely um, uh, countercultural. And if they're going to be countercultural, they'll start, they should start kicking it against the, the sort of woke cultural hegemony, which is what we've got. I mean, the, the bizarre thing about this is that, um, you know, it's incredible conservatism you've got in this. They're, they're all thinking the same thing. Very, very few people are, are, are able to step out of it and actually say, is that right? I mean, is, is that really the way we should be going? How about this? Um, so I think until we get that, you will get, I mean, none of these, none of these cultural movements um, retain hegemony for, for forever. It, 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 cultural history proves that. So you go through waves where this sort of thing is at a high point. And you will get a reaction against it. Uh, and you can see, as I say, in some of the data coming through, you can see uh, some of the younger age groups actually kicking against the sort of wokery of their, uh, of their baby boomer parents and, and actually coming up with some... I mean, if, you, if a young person wants to shock anyone in the university or shock their parents, then, then be a cultural conservative. <laughs> Here, here, absolutely. I'm with you 100% there. Yeah. Uh, and I think unless the BBC does adapt or change, surely they're losing justification to demand the licence fee if they don't represent people in the way they should. Yeah, no, that's absolutely right. I mean, they, you either, my view is you either uh, buck up, I mean, but I, you either buck up and, 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 and fulfil the charter of impartiality, or literally your funding should be removed. I mean, Manic, when he, when he drafted the some of the stuff on arts funding, which you can have a look on SDP, .org.uk. We're really clear about that. You, you, if you're going to show, if you're unable to show um, a, a diversity of opinion uh, uh, and, and exhibits and things, if you start censoring stuff, then your arts funding should be removed. It's as simple as that. And I think, I, I, again, a lot of people have said, well, how, when is it going to change? How is it going to change? And I, 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 it's the same with tenured university uh, professors and so on. It's only when people start paying a price for this stuff that actually you will get change. So I think for too long, people have been able to um, pick at this, um, at, at these things, which are really, a lot of the signaling is just um, uh, middle-class sort of virtue appropriation. You know, it's, it's, it's trying to establish yourself in the moral hierarchy and it's cost-free. Well, if it's cost-free, 
they'll do it. And if it isn't cost free, that you might have an impact on on what is done. Absolutely. And uh, a loose link to that, because one of the big stories at the moment uh, centers on the infamous panorama interview of Diana by Martin Bashir. Uh, personally, I was quite shocked to discover that the BBC had been behaving in this way, you know, forging documents, inventing stories. And the BBC also profited from selling that footage. Six figure sums we're talking about here. So they could potentially face criminal charges. Uh, this isn't what we'd expect from a state broadcaster, is it? What, what's your take on this? It isn't. I mean, but remember, Calvin, that there's, there's nothing new under the sun and there's certainly nothing in humanity. I mean, um, remember, you know, there's a broad sweep of, 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 of what we've seen. Um, yes, te- there's been progress in technology. Uh, there's been a great deal of change in human history uh, through science and technology. But do you think that human ethics have changed very much since the ancients? I don't. And, and so you've, you've got a situation there where, yes, in, in the 80s and 90s were, is, a, is, a very, um, is a very ambitious journalist willing to bend the rules? Yeah. And I think we've seen that throughout history. So I don't think, again, it's regrettable and it should never have happened. Um, and a lot of people are, you know, getting their heads down now and trying to, to sort of avoid criticism. But it, again, it, it, the, the national broadcaster with, uh, with public funding going into it should be insulated from some of these pressures. I mean, one of the, again, one of the reasons the BBC is different to uh, a commercial uh, entity is that it doesn't have to sell advertising or it doesn't have to rely on um rich benefactors. Now, if that's the case, then you really, you've got to live up to that. You've got to be impartial and you've got to do the right thing. So doing the right thing, um, you might even say it's a privilege of a, of a national broadcaster, really, but they, they fell short there. Yeah, it's their responsibility to hold themselves to higher standards, isn't it? Mm. And I don't think that's what they've been doing recently. Uh, I think we share a, a lot of common ground on this issue in that, you know, it used to be a treasure, not so much these days, it's fallen down. There is still hope that it could, there, there could be uh, some changes, but I don't think that's going to happen. But regardless, they can't continue to do what they're doing and charge people for the privilege of mm. having, to, you know, the fact that anyone what, who's watching any live TV has to pay the BBC for what they're doing, regardless of what you're watching, makes no sense. Um, it doesn't, but the, the, and the difficulty we have is that, I mean, I, I think the license fee thing, it's just an anomaly. I mean, it, and it's, yeah. because it's a flat tax, it's also uh, iniquitous, clearly. Uh, they can make exceptions for older people. They can do as many things like that as they like, but basically it's iniquitous. So we we f- find it quite easy to say get rid of that. But remember, we'd still be funding it. I mean, taxpayers will still be funding this if it is a, broad, a national broadcaster. And as I say, the reason I want it to be to retain uh, its status as a national broadcaster is that there is something very special about that. And I, again, we've we've spoken privately about this. Remember that the the you know the, the political bias and Newsnight and all the other stuff, you know, and uh, you know, and silly things like largely peaceful, <laughs> all of these things exist. But against that, also, you've got farming today. You've got the shipping forecast, which uh, you know is part of the sort of national architecture of what we do. Test match special, something understood. Radio three is pretty good. Um, so there's a lot of good there, and I think it's I think if we're positive, we can. Uh, retain some of that. I mean, I just I'm speaking on an entirely personal level. I think the mandate to entertain uh, is. I think we're struggling with that now. Um, I think I'd, I'd narrow the whole thing down, slim the whole thing down, and its prime, uh, you know, aim should be to inform. That's what it should do. And I think you know you keep that as some high quality art, arts programming, and that's what the maybe the um, commercial organisations can't do. I'm with you on that, but the other arm is to educate as well. And that's where we have problems because while the BBC is trying to educate uh, in line with their woke ideology, you know, they're encouraging, you know, things like critical race theory, which we've talk, talked about in the past as well. And they're, they're pushing their own political agendas through their, their remit to educate. So I think if it did go down just the line of informing, that might narrow the target so much that they couldn't be so political perhaps that's a route they could take if they you know if they do want to reform but is there appetite for that i don't know um yeah i mean i i take your point on that but at least it would focus the 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 mind at least it would focus the point i mean as i say personally i'm only speaking personally if you lose strictly things wouldn't miss it commercial commercial organizations do that stuff 
There we go. Scrap it. William okay. Clifton, leader of the SDP. Thank you very much for your time today. It's been an absolute pleasure. Absolute pleasure. Take care, Calvin. Thank you.